Hey guys, how's it going? Hope you're doing well. My name is Crown and today I'm going to read you some very interesting stories that I hope that you're gonna love. And now, without further ado, let's go! So there I was, just minding my own business, arranging the shelves at the store. It was a regular Tuesday afternoon, nothing out of the ordinary, but turns out this will be a day that was about to become a chapter in the annals of entitled people history. We got a new manager, Karen. Now, I don't want to judge a book by its cover, but if Entitled had a face, it would be Karen's. <laughs> she waltzed in like she owned the place, making changes left and right. The first thing she did was rearrange the entire store layout, claiming it was for better customer experience. Spoiler alert, it wasn't. One fine day, Karen's radar of entitlement locked onto poor old Charlie. Now Charlie was a gem of a person, always had a smile on his face despite the fact that he rolled around the store in a wheelchair. Yes, he was disabled, but that never stopped him from doing his job efficiently. Heck, that was more productive than have the staff combined. So on this one day, Karen storms up to Charlie while he's stuck in the shelves with canned beans. I'm just a few aisles away pretending to organize a potato chip display while eavesdropping on their conversation. Charlie, we need to talk, Karen says, crossing her arms like she's about to drop some divine wisdom. Charlie looks up, his bushy white eyebrows raised in surprise. Sure, what's up? Karen looks around, making sure no one else is within earshot. I've been observing you, and I must say it's not appropriate for someone like you to be working here. I nearly drop a bag of chips at that line. Someone like you? Seriously, Karen? Charlie plays his soul stays calm. I'm not sure I understand. Is there an issue with my work? Oh, there is an issue, all right. Karen says, leaning in like she's about to spill the juiciest gossip. You being in a wheelchair is bad for the store's image. We can't have customers thinking we employ disabled people. It's just not good for the business. I'm fuming at this point. I mean, who says that kind of stuff? But I keep arranging those chips, not wanting to blow my cover, as a stealthy eavesdropper. Charlie, on the other hand, looks genuinely puzzled. I've been working here for years and no one had a problem with it before. Why now? Karen smirks, thinking she's dropping the mic. Well, now I'm in charge and I have standards to uphold. It's nothing personal, Charlie. Just straight business. That did it for me. I couldn't take it anymore. I abandon the chips and storm over, pretending to be oblivious to their conversation. Hey, Charlie. Need help with these beans? I ask, shooting Karen the dirtiest look I can muster. Oh, thanks. That would be great. Charlie replies grateful for the interruption. I start helping him, shooting Karen glares with every can I pick up. She gets the message and scurries away, muttering something about checking the inventory. As soon as she's out of earshot, Charlie leans in and whispers, Can you believe this? I've never been treated like this in all my years here. I shake my head. Oh man, it's unbelievable, Charlie. She's out of line. But little did Karen know she just kicked the hornet's nest. You see, Charlie wasn't just any disabled worker. He was a co-owner for the store. Yep, one of the people who signed her paychecks. Only me and a couple of other workers knew this fact. Karen's entitled antics continue. She is rearranging the store layout again, making the aisles more confusing than a maze. Customers are complaining left and right, but she brushes it off, claiming that it's for their own good. But just when everybody is about to had enough, Charlie calls for a staff meeting. We all gather in the break room and Karen strolls in, thinking she's a queen of the world. Listen, everybody. Charlie starts, wheeling himself to the front of the room. I've been observing the changes in a store and it has come to my attention that some decisions were made without proper consultation and concentration for the staff and customers. Karen rolls her eyes, not realizing that her reign of entitlement is about to crumble. Charlie continues, As one of the owners of this store, I believe it's my responsibility to ensure that the values and standards we uphold here are in the best interest to both our employees and customers. With that said, I've decided to make some changes. I've decided to relieve Karen of her duties as a manager, Charlie announces, and the room erupts in a mix of gasps and snickering. Karen, however, is in shock. She stammers, You can't do that. 
I am the manager. You can't just... Charlie cuts her off with a stern look. Actually, I can. You see? I'm not just an employee here. I'm a co-owner. And it's clear that your management style doesn't align with the values of this store. Karen turns pale. But you're disabled. You can't own a store. Charlie chuckles. Well, surprise. Disability doesn't define what a person can or cannot do. And in this case, it turns out it's the store owner who's been rolling around in a wheelchair all along. The room falls silent and Karen is left speechless. Some of the staff, on the other hand, start shouting, Get the hell out of here, Karen! As Karen gathers her belongings, escorted out by security, she shoots Charlie an angry look, but he just smiles and waves. Charlie continued to manage the store himself, making decisions that benefited everyone, disabled or not. And as for Karen, well, let's just say, she learned a valuable lesson that day. Or at least I hope. Three months ago, my husband's sister, Emma, came knocking on our door with a suitcase and a sob story about needing a place to crash until she got back on her feet. Being the good-hearted people we are, my husband and I welcomed her into our home. To show her gratitude, Emma offered to babysit our two kids, a six-year-old daughter and a three-year-old son, who happens to be on the autism spectrum with delayed speech and language development. We thought it was a win-win. She gets a roof over her head and we get some free babysitting. What could go wrong, right? Fast forward to three weeks ago, Emma was babysitting and I was at work when I got a call that would send any parents heart racing. It was the police. They told me they had found my three-year-old son wandering the streets, alone and scared. Apparently, he had managed to slip out of the front door without Emma noticing. How does that even happen? When I confronted Emma about it later, the conversation went something like this. Emma, what the hell happened? Why did the police find our son wandering around the neighborhood? Oh, it was just a little misunderstanding. He must have sneaked out when I wasn't looking. Kids, you know. Misunderstanding? He's free and has autism. You were supposed to be watching him. I did my best. I panicked and I searched for him for an hour before calling the police. I thought I could find him myself. You spent an hour searching before calling the police? What if something had happened to him? What if someone had taken him? Oh, relax. He's fine now, isn't he? The police brought him back home. That's not the point. You were supposed to keep him safe. And why didn't you call me or my husband immediately? I didn't want to worry you. I thought I could handle it. Handle it? You put our son's safety at risk? You broke our trust, Emma. The fallout from that conversation was a heated argument. And I couldn't shake off the feeling that she might not have even told us if the police hadn't explicitly instructed her to do so. It felt like she was more concerned about covering her tracks than our son's well-being. I made a tough call. I asked Emma to leave our home. I couldn't trust her with our kids after what happened. But the real drama began when I told my husband about my decision. Well, he wasn't too thrilled, to say the least. You kicked her out? Really? It was an honest mistake. Anyone could have let a kid slip away for a moment. Honest mistake? He spent an hour searching before involving the police, and she didn't even bother to call us right away. She panicked. She didn't want to bother us at work. And now you've left her with nowhere to go. That's pretty harsh. Harsh or not, my priority was my son's safety. I couldn't wrap my head around the idea that someone who was supposed to be responsible for him could let this happen. The fact that she jeopardized his safety and didn't immediately inform us was unforgivable. But my husband had a point. Emma had no alternative living arrangements. And I felt a twinge of guilt about putting her out on the street. It was a messy situation and I couldn't help but question myself. Am I the jerk here? Days turned into nights and I found myself torn between my anger and a nagging guilt. Was I too harsh? Was I overreacting? And I decided to talk to my husband again, hoping we could find some middle ground. Look, I get that you think I was too severe. But it's about our son's safety. I can't just overlook that. I understand, but she's family. And she has nowhere else to go. Maybe we can find a compromise, like giving her another chance, but with stricter rules. Another chance? After what happened? I don't know if I can trust her again. We went back and forth arguing about trust, safety, and family loyalty. It wasn't easy, and emotions were running high, but in the end we decided to give Emma another chance 
under some strict conditions. I laid down the rules. No more unsupervised time with the kids, especially our son. She needed to be vigilant, no exceptions, but we also installed extra locks on the doors to ensure our son couldn't pull a disappearing act again. Emma begrudgingly agreed, realizing she was lucky to even have a roof over her head. The tension in the house was palpable, but we were trying to make it work for the sake of the family harmony. Days turned into weeks and surprisingly, things seemed to be going smoothly. Emma was following the rules and the kids were safe and sound. Maybe, just maybe, we could move past this dark chapter and rebuild the trust that had been shattered. But deep down, the nagging doubt persisted. Could I truly trust her again? Was I putting my family at risk by giving her a second chance? The uncertainty gnawed at me, but I was determined to make it work for the sake of the family unity. One evening, as I watched Emma playing with the kids in the living room, I couldn't help but wonder if I had made the right decision. My husband approached me, sensing my inner turmoil. Do you think we did the right thing by giving her another chance? I honestly don't know. I want to believe people can change, but this is about our son's safety. I can't afford to be wrong. We'll keep a close eye on her. If she misses up again, she's out for good. But let's just give her a chance to prove she can be responsible. And so we cautiously moved forward, hoping that Emma had truly learned from her mistake. The days turned into weeks and the unease began to fade. It seemed like we might be on a path to healing. Then came the day that shook the fragile peace we had managed to establish. I received a call from the school about our daughter. Hello, Mrs. Smith. This is Mrs. Johnson, your daughter's teacher. I wanted to talk to you about that incident that happened today. My heart sank. What now? It seems that Emma picked up your daughter from school without your knowledge. She said you had asked her to do so. What? I never asked her to pick up my daughter. Where is she now? She's here in the school office with your daughter. We wanted to confirm with you before releasing her into Emma's care. I rushed to the school, my mind racing with a mix of anger and fear. How could she do something so reckless again? I stormed into the office where Emma and my daughter were waiting. What the hell, Emma? Why did you pick up our daughter without telling us? I thought it would save you the trip. You're always so busy and I thought I was helping. Helping? You don't get to decide that on your own. You put our daughter at risk by taking her without our knowledge. What if something had happened to her? I was just trying to help here. I don't see why you're making such a big deal out of it. Because you're proven you can't be trusted. You jeopardized our son's safety and now you're pulling this stunt with our daughter. I can't believe you will be so irresponsible again. The school staff looked on awkwardly as our argument escalated. The trust I had tried to rebuild crumbled once more. It was clear that Emma hadn't learned from her mistakes and I couldn't let her put my children in danger again. I took a deep breath and turned to the school staff. I appreciate your concern, but I cannot allow Emma to pick up my daughter. From now on, only my husband or I will be authorized to do so. We confronted Emma, expressing our disappointment and concern for our children's safety. It wasn't an easy conversation, but it needed to happen. You've shown that you can be responsible, Emma. We can't risk our children's safety any longer. You need to find another place to stay. She protested, argued, and pleaded. But our decision was final. The next day, she packed her bags and left. The house felt lighter and the air less tense. It was a tough choice, but it was the right one. So am I the jerk? Maybe. But sometimes being a jerk is the only way to ensure the safety of those you love. And now with some comments on a post. Someone saying, you're not the jerk. An honest mistake? Initially, yes, kids can be slippery little devils. The big mistake was not calling you. Spinning her wheel, searching for an hour, then hearing the police thankfully had him, man. When she was going to call you? Has she even apologized? Doesn't sound like it. She's staying with you to get back on her feet. Though, she's an adult. This isn't some 19-year-old being an idiot. She should have known better. And since she doesn't, no. She cannot be relied upon. And she deserves banishment. Another commenter goes with, not the jerk. Drowning is the first cause of death for autistic children. Your son eloped. Her first call should have been to you to find out if there was any place he was known to go so she could check there first 
while she was waiting for you and a police. A third commenter goes with, your son could have died. Also, many states make parents who lose their children take parenting classes and have strikes against that can cause them to lose their children. This is a serious issue and she should not be trusted with your child. Edit, OP is not the jerk. I would 1000% kick her out hard times or not. Your son could have been seriously injured or worse. And now we have reached the end of today's stories. Thank you for watching and see you next time.